I like writing C++ code. I wrote a cool class called Unique Pseudo Function, and today I'm going to show you how I wrote it. Who likes std function? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a nice tool. Who likes overloading? Everyone. Great. Well, I'm going to show you how I put these two things together. So first, I show you the title page, then I show you this outline, then I'm going to give you the rest of the talk. You know, you know what's the, what it's all about. So what's unique pseudo function? It's like a unique function with multiple overloads of a call operator instead of just one. By the way, the proposal for unique function, I think it's called any invocable now, but it's the same thing. What's the difference? For a unique function like std function, you list one function as its template argument. For my class, you can list as many as you like, as long as they would be valid overload sets. Well, how would you use this kind of thing? Well, imagine you have function objects that themselves have multiple overloads of a call operator. You know which overloads you want, but you don't know until the runtime which one of these you want to pass. Well, declare your function taking a unique pseudo function with all the overloads and pass whichever one you like. Let's say you have things with templated call operators like plus or minus or void. These can work on anything that defines a plus or minus operator. But you know ahead of time, I want to do just ints. I messed this up. This is in the wrong order. There we go. Let's say you know ahead of time if you want just ints or floats, but you don't know if you want plus or minus. Just declare that. Declare you want a unique pseudo function that takes all the things. And later on, you can pass plus or minus. It'll work. Let's say you want to visit a variant. Well, you can write your own class, or you can use the proposed std overload or overloaded to build up a type from a bunch of lambdas that do what you want. But if you just want to use std visit to call that thing, that has to be a template because std overloaded doesn't, it keeps all the type information there. Well, instead, if you declare a unique pseudo function of all the possibilities of a variant, you can visit it in a CPP file and pass whatever you want. So I didn't write this class all at once from day one. I didn't wake up one day and decide, I want to write a type erase overload set. I was using std function for a while, but I ran into a few limitations. And I decided I'll fix them. The first one is, what if I have a lambda that is not movable for whatever reason, and they want to pass that as an std function? Well, I can't. I get this error. std function requires the things inside to be copyable. Well, I can fix this by using shared pointers, but that's not the semantics I want. I really like having unique ownership. So what's the simplest class I can write to fix this problem? Well, let's just write the class. I'm going to have a unique pointer to a pure abstract base that I'm going to cover in the next slide. What's the base? It's just something that can be invoked. It has a pure virtual call operator and a virtual destructor. And the right holds a T that can be invoked and overrides the call operator to call the T. For the constructor, I take any T, I put it in a derived and sort of pointer to that. And now I can call it. This is simple, and this is the technique Sean Perrin describes in one of his talks. So that's great. It works. By the way, here's the structure of the class I just wrote. On a typical implementation, a virtual class will have a pointer to some B table off somewhere that the compiler generates for you. Here's a non-rhetorical, non-trick question. What's the size of my unique function? Go ahead, raise your hands. It's, it's OK. Or yell out the answer if you know. No one? This is really not a trick question. It's the size of unique pointer, because that's what you have. Now next, non-rhetorical, non-trick question. How many pointer jumps do you need to make to actually call a thing? Come on, somebody yell out the answer. Two. And the others? There we go. It's three. Once to reach the derived, once to reach the V table, and the V table stores function pointers. So that's the third. Three pointer jumps. Keep this in mind. So now I can, I can use move-only objects and I can call them. But there's a little awkwardness. The only way I can construct this kind of function is by explicitly calling its constructor. 
If I just try to assign something or implicitly convert, that won't work. Why? I made the constructor explicit. Well, what happens if I don't? I get a new kind of problem. Now, my unique function is constructible from anything. So if I have an overloaded function that takes an int or my unique function and I pass it something that's not really callable but isn't an int either, the compiler will try to construct my unique function from the thing and it will fail with a hard error because the thing is not callable. How can I fix this? By constraining its constructor. Now I could use concepts or enable if I'm targeting C++17, so I'll stick with enable if for now. How do I constrain it? I make the constructor implicit and only allow things that are invocable using a type trait that the standard handily provides. Now, if the thing is not invocable, that constructor disappears. And now I can call test with test and it knows what I mean. The int, not the callable. That's basically any invocable or unique function for the no arguments case. Let's make it generic. I want to be able to pass more things. The class looks very similar. Now it's a template, not just a class, and it's defined only if a single argument is a function type. Otherwise, the base and derived inside look exactly the same. The base is, again, a pure virtual call operator that takes the arguments I say it should take and returns what I say it should return with a virtual destructor. And derived is the same. It holds a T and calls the T. The constructor of the outer class is similarly constrained, but now I need to make sure that the thing is callable with the arguments that I want and that such a call returns the return type that I want. Very happily, the standard provides a type trait for exactly that kind of thing. Is invocable RV. Check the return type, check the arguments, and it works. And the call operator now needs to forward the arguments as well. Both of these still have just one overload of a call operator. I want to have more than one. Could I somehow extend this pattern, just have multiple pure virtual overloads of a call operator and override them all? I wasn't smart enough to do this kind of thing. One of my coworkers was, and if you're interested after, I can show you how he did it. But I chose a different way. What if instead of using the virtual keyword in runtime polymorphism and having the compiler generate me these tables, I do it myself using templates. Here's how. I'm going to change a new pseudo function to store a pointer to a data. This will be whatever type it actually calls and a pointer to a vtable. From now on, vtable, it's a class template that I wrote that will contain the function pointers that it needs. Let me show you what that consists of. First, I'm going to declare some functions. All vtables will store pointers to ver versions of these functions. First, it's destroy impl. This is what the pure virtual destructor would have done. How do I destroy the actual object that I have? A function could be empty, meaning there is no object there. That's why I have an empty destroy impl. Void pointer doesn't point to anything and there is nothing to do. Otherwise, void pointer data points to an object of type t that was allocated by operator new. I need to delete the thing. So I do it. Similarly, invoke impl for the empty case, what happens if you call an empty function? For std function, it throws bad function call. I chose to do the same. If you have a non-empty function, then the data pointer points to some object of type t. So I just invoke it. Next, I'm going to make a structure that stores the right kind of pointer to destroy impl. The empty case, it stores a pointer to the empty function. For the non-empty case, and I'm using tag dispatch here to say what type I will be destroying later, I store a pointer to the function that will destroy that type. Next, I need to store a pointer to one invoke function. That is the function that I will call for one of the overloads of my unique pseudo function. By the way, if you have questions, feel free to ask anytime, just yell it or raise your hand, whatever. So the vtable entry is the, yes, I have a question. I will try. Thank you. By the way, the question was go slower. I'm gonna try to do that. Okay, so. A vtable entry is a class template. It's defined only if a template argument is a function type. It stores a pointer to a function that has that signature, 
but also takes a void pointer data, which is the object I eventually plan to call. In its default constructable, by default it stores a pointer, actually references in this case, to a function that will throw that function call. If I pass some tag type, it will store a pointer to a function that will call an object of that type. By the way, this constructor is constrained. It's only present if a type in the tag can be called in the way that I want. Otherwise, this constructor disappears. There is also an overload of a call operator that takes a void pointer and passes it and all the rest of the things along to the pointed to function. Now I need to put these things together. I need to be able to destroy an object of arbitrary type and invoke an object of arbitrary type with all the overloads that I want. The way I do this is by inheriting from destroyer and all the vtable entries, one for each of the overloads that I specify. The default constructor is, well, default, other, everything points to the empty things. The non-default constructor takes a tag type and is constrained to take only types that support all of the overloads that I want using fold expressions. And I'm also inheriting all the call operators from every vtable entry that I, that I inherit from. This way, I let the compiler do the overload resolution for me. Now, instances of this vtable thing, they're all static constexts for statically allocated generated at compile time. Unique pseudo function always stores a valid pointer to one of these things, either the empty one, which is default constructed, or the non-empty one for a particular type that that object holds. Now I can implement the constructors. In the empty case, it doesn't really matter what data points to, as long as the vtable pointer points to the empty vtable for all these overloads. The move constructor, by the way, there is no copying. This is move only and unique. The move constructor just steals all the pointers from the other object, leaving it null and empty. The assignment operator does the same thing. I'm using the copy swap idiom here just to simplify it. The destructor just calls destroy on the data. The vtable pointer is always valid and the function inside always does the right thing. So even if this unique pseudo function is empty, this works. And if it's not empty, it will delete whatever data points to really. And swap just moves the pointers around. It's cheap, right? Now there's the converting constructor. This takes any T that is callable in all the ways that I need and heap allocates a decay copy of it and stores a pointer to a vtable for the right t. This constructor is constrained and I'll show you exactly how. The first condition is that the t isn't already a pseudo function. If it is, then one of the other constructors should take precedence. I want this one removed. This is important in case I try to pass an l value to a unique pseudo function. If I didn't have this, there would be infinite recursion. It wouldn't work. That constraint needs to be there. The second constraint is, would I be able to construct a vtable from a tag of this type if I tried? This is a, an indirect way of asking, does that t support all the overloads that I want? If it does, great. I'll construct it. If not, this constructor disappears. Finally, I have a call operator. I want this unique pseudo function to be invoked with just all the arguments that you list. But all the function pointers inside take an extra argument, the data. So I just forward everything along and pass the data first. By the way, the reason I need to repeat the whole thing in a, the decal type at the front is so that this call operator disappears if I try to call it in a way that isn't supported. Vittorio has a nice five-minute talk about exactly why this is needed and how great it would be if it weren't, so I have a link for that here. Here's the structure of this class I just wrote. Non-rhetorical, non-trick question. What's the size of a unique pseudo function? Raise your hand or yell it out. Anyone? You're not paying attention. Louder. Two pointers. It's two pointers large. Next question. How many pointer jumps to call anything? Two, that's right. 
want to get to the V-table, which is now the pointer to the V-table is directly in the object instead of indirectly as part of some heap allocated thing. One pointer to get to the V-table, one more pointer to get to the actual function. Two. Great. This now works. So what do we have so far? We have a new pseudo function. It's move only. It has multiple overloads of a call operator. Just one if you want, but as many as you like. And it can be constructed conditionally from any object that supports all the overloads. Any questions so far? By the way, if you use your phone to scan this QR code and pass the resulting text through the command I put at the top, you'll get the C++ code that implements the class I just showed you. If you're using Apple-based platforms, you need to hold down the icon and select copy text. Questions. This is the perfect time to ask questions. Come on. Yes. Excellent question. Is there a reason why the vtable is not part of the object? Well, first of all, the reason I chose to do it this way is so that the size of the object doesn't depend on how many overloads you have. Otherwise, you need to have one function for every overload. Second, when I tried this code with the modern, with the latest compilers and the highest optimizations, the compiler can see through the whole thing. If it can see where you constructed your unique pseudo function and where you use it, all the calls just disappear. And I'll also show you a version of this code that doesn't do that later if I have time. Any more questions before I move on? Yes. So, Okay, the question is, do I actually need these overloads? Couldn't I use a variant somehow to delay the decision until later? Right, so if you're always more than one closure, right, then you can use a value and then you just need to let this initialize the overload. What would the variant contain? So all the different overload potentials. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, you'll need to rephrase that a different way. I don't understand your question. Do you mean a variant of the different STD functions or a variant of tuples or something? Well, I haven't thought about how different it is. I, ha I have a lot. The question is, could I somehow pass a variant of, a, of a tuples of a possible arguments? And right. yes, I could. The problem with that approach is now the function inside has to do another runtime dispatch to pick uh, which of the, which of the, which part of a variant is active, which must happen at runtime. Yes. Right. This approach uses the compiler's built-in overload resolution to decide at compile time which version of a function I wanted to call. So the caller knows I need to call this overload, and the callee knows I need to call I was called with this overload. There is just one in direction here, and that's the function pointer inside the V table. Otherwise, I, the caller would need to construct a variant. And it knows what it wants to call. But the call he doesn't, it needs to look into a variant and how was I called? Yeah, your approach is strictly superior. Any other questions? Did everybody who wanted to scan this code do so? Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. Moving on. So this code is great and it will work in 95% of cases, but there are still a few problems or improvements that could be made. For example, everything is always on the heap. Even if you store a function pointer or an empty lambda, it's still on the heap. We can fix that. There are also some types of arguments where the overload resolution doesn't quite work. And finally, if you have a big unique pseudo function with you know, many overloads, and you try to store it in a smaller unique pseudo function with a smaller set of overloads, but otherwise exactly the same ones, 
that, that has some overhead. Well, let's cover those now. So imagine hypothetically, I have an overloaded function. It takes either nothing or this empty struct. And I call it with curly braces. The compiler is able to deduce, oh, you must have meant to call it with an S. That works, great. If I try to do the same thing with a unique pseudo function, it will fail to compile. Why would it fail to compile? Because the call operator on a unique pseudo function, it's not an overload set, it's a template. The compiler must deduce the types of the arguments, but if it's curly braces, there isn't the type yet. So how can we fix this? Well, let's fix it by making the call operator not a template, but a real overload set. First, remember that each vtable entry had a call operator that takes a void pointer and all the arguments that I said it should take. Remove that, we won't use it anymore. Next, the vtable itself inherited all of those. They don't exist, remove that line. Next, I'm going to introduce a new class, pseudo overload. This is like, kind of like a CRTP and also the empty base optimization. Each pseudo overload never exists on its own. It exists only as a base sub-object of a unique pseudo function. It implements just one call operator, which is based on the first, based on the function that is the first argument. That call operator looks into the unique pseudo function that must be the derived type. It gets the vtable and gets the data pointer, and it accesses the vtable entry of the matching function signature. And it calls that vtable entries function pointer directly. Next, I change unique pseudo function to inherit from these. It inherits from one pseudo overload for every function in its template argument list. And finally, it inherits all of their call operators. There is no more big template operator equals with auto decal type. No, just inherit them. Now, it works. The call operator isn't a template that needs to reduce the types and forward them along. I have a fixed set of known non-template call operators. Now, if I call a unique pseudo function with curly braces, the compiler sees a fixed set of candidates and it can pick the one that works. Great, this works. So, so far we have a unique pseudo function that's move only, has multiple calls, multiple overloads of a call operator, and now it can pass, you can pass any type you like. You can pass curly braces, you can pass pointers to overload sets, it will all work exactly as it would for regular functions. And as before, you can construct it from any invocable object that supports all the overloads. Here's the code so far. Any questions? I can't hear you, you'll have to speak up or come to the microphone. so that it can store non-copyable types. It can't be copyable if you want to store something with a unique pointer inside. That, that's the point. Uh, I could make it copyable, but that was, it would be pretty easy to do so. But my requirements were I want the unique objects. Any more questions? No, all right. Five, four, three, Two, one, moving on. So, next problem. Suppose I have a big unique pseudo function with a bunch of overloads. I want to store it in a smaller unique pseudo function with a subset of those overloads. They have to be an exact match, but smaller. What I want to have happen is I start with this unique pseudo function. It has a pointer to some data and a pointer to some vtable. I want to end up with a different unique pseudo function that has a pointer to the same data, but to a smaller vtable. It will have exactly the same function pointers in it, but some are missing. It's smaller. That's what I want to happen. What happens instead is I get a unique pseudo function that stores a pointer to another unique pseudo function. And I have a vtable that first casts the pointer to another unique pseudo function and calls that. Every time I do this, I have another layer of indirection, an extra set of pointers to jump through. Why does this happen? Well, it happens because the vtable that I store in a unique pseudo function, rather, the pointer I store in a unique pseudo function, points to a statically allocated vtable. 
That's a V table that I generated at compile time when I constructed that initial unique pseudo function. But this conversion that I want to do right now, it happens at runtime. I can't know when I construct a big unique pseudo function what possible conversions I might need to make. I can't generate the smaller versions of that V table ahead of time. Maybe it's possible, but I couldn't find a practical way to do it. If you can, come talk to me after, I'd be happy to listen. So instead, I chose to solve this problem a different way. Instead of having a statically allocated V table that stores all the pointers, let's store all the function pointers directly inside the class. By the way, thanks for asking that question earlier. So let's introduce some new classes that do this. In unique lifetime, vtable entry, will be, which will be slightly different now, and pseudo overload will also need to change. I will inherit from all of these. There are no more data members. Unique lifetime takes care of the object storage and lifetime needs, and each of the pseudo overloads will now store our function pointers directly. So what's unique lifetime? It puts together the data pointer and the destroy function pointer from the destructor before. The empty constructor, it's as you expect. There is no data and destroy points to the empty destroy function. There is no copying. Move swaps the pointers around. Assignment also swaps the pointers around. And this is not interesting at all, so I'm skipping through it. Destro the destructor, as before, calls the destroy function. It's always valid, always does the right thing. And swap, well, swaps the pointers around. The converting constructor takes a tag. This just makes it easier when I do perfect forwarding to sort of co collapse the const L value reference or mutable R value, R value reference into the same thing. Notice that this constructor is not constrained. That's because unique lifetime doesn't actually depend on any of the function signatures that I might need to call later. It's not even a template. Next, vtable entry. The Slack class looks similar to before, but, by the way, the the constructor is constrained exactly as it was before. But in addition to all the things that it used to do, I now need to have move semantics. The vtable entry is part of, indirectly, it's part of a unique pseudo function. And when I move this thing, I want the original that was moved from to become empty. So I implement the move constructor and the move assignment operator to put the empty invoke in the moved from object. And swap is the same. Pseudo overload now contains a vtable entry inside it, and it forwards the appropriate uh, special member functions. And it has a call operator, but now instead of reaching inside the unique pseudo function of which it is a base class, it calls its own invoke pointer that's part of its vtable entry. So before the function pointer used to live as part of a statically allocated struct, now it's a data member. And swap works the same. Just swap the pointers around. Now, this slide changed a little bit. Now, instead of new, newing the object myself, I pass the decayed type as a tag and the forward the actual argument to unique lifetime to construct the thing and also store the right pointer to the destroy impulse. And I also forward a tag of the type to each of pseudo overloads, so they will store the correct function pointer inside. This is the new constructor. It's only enabled if the argument is a different kind of unique pseudo function. And additionally, if that unique pseudo function store has all the overloads that this one wants. It might have extras, but it must at least have all the ones that I need. And when that is the case, I steal its unique lifetime, stealing its object, and I also move each of its pseudo overloads into my pseudo overloads, stealing the function pointers, essentially. Now the class looks like this. I have the data, the destroy function pointer, and the function pointer for each of the overloads that I want. It makes my object bigger. Now if I have more overloads, I need more function pointers and I pay that cost every time I want to construct, remove, or anything. But in exchange, I can now 
adapt these objects, convert a bigger one into a smaller one, without incurring extra interactions every time, by just moving the function pointers around. So if I start with this big one with two overloads, I can convert it into a smaller one with one overload, without any extra stuff, those are the same pointers as we were before. So, so far we have the same unique pseudo function, it's to move only, it supports all the overloads with the correct overloading rules, it's constructible from any invocable object, and I can also cheaply and efficiently convert big ones into small ones without, again, without paying for extra overhead. Here's the code. Any questions so far? Yes. Yes, that hasn't changed at all. Destroy still, it will still delete the object if there is one. They're the same destroy functions as before. Any more questions? Did everybody who wanted to scan the code? Yes. No, I mean, I, okay. Did you? Press and hold the icon that shows up. Yes. Yeah, it doesn't work. You don't have the option to copy the text? Um, so I took a picture of it and I like uploaded it to a website that decodes and that also did work. Works for me. Okay. I, by the way, Android users, please help your fellow food platformers. Okay. Five? Four, three, two, one. I have to move on now. So the last problem is the heap. This implementation allocates anything on the heap. You have a function pointer, an empty lambda, a really tiny struct on the heap. Can we do better? Sure, of course. This is C++, why not? I'm going to do the in-place or the small buffer optimization. Let's have a buffer. What's a buffer? It's either a char array that stores something directly, or it's a pointer to some heap allocated thing. I'm going to give it some member functions that will make using it much easier later. The first is fits. Does this type t, but I pass as an explicit template argument, fit inside of a buffer? What fits inside of a buffer? Anything that's small enough, not over aligned, and is also null through move constructible and null through destructible. I really want my unique function to itself be null remove constructible and destructible, so I extend that requirement to anything I store in line. If you can't do that, I'm going to heap allocate and swap pointers around instead. By the way, there's a very nice proposal called Trivially Relocatable that will make a move destroy operation basically as cheap as a mem copy. Were that part of a the language, then that's the requirement I would use here. So that would be very nice for my unique pseudo function to itself be trivially relocatable. But for now, this is what I have. It just has to be small enough and null throw enough. Next, I want to construct some t, which I pass as an explicit argument, in the buffer from these arguments that I deduce. How do I do that? Well, if it fits, I place it new it in the care array. If it doesn't fit, I store a pointer to a heap allocated version of the thing. Destroy does the same thing. If the t fits, it must be in the buffer. I just call it the structure. If it doesn't fit, I'll delete the heap allocated pointer. By the way, can anybody see the mistake I'm making on the slide? Launder. I have to launder the pointer before I destroy it. But on practical compilers, certainly the ones I use, this is just fine. There is another interesting operation. If I want to move an object from my buffer into a new buffer that's currently empty, I can do that. If it's in the buffer, meaning if it fits, I'll move construct an object in the new buffer from the one that I contained. If not, I'll just move a pointer along. Finally, access. If it fits, I'll reinterpret cast a pointer. If it doesn't fit, I'll reinterpret cast the other pointer. Same as before. Next, I'm going to change my invoke impl functions. These are the functions that would have previously invoked the t pointed to by void star. Now they take a buffer instead. If it's empty, I don't care about the buffer, I just throw a bad function call. If it's not empty, it stores a t. I 
tells the buffer, get the T what you contain, either in place or not, and then I'll just invoke it. Destroy changes slightly more. Now, in addition to just destroying the thing in the buffer, I might want to move it first. I combine those operations into one function called destroy move. It always destroys the object in the first buffer, but if a pointer is not null, it will first move construct an object in the pointed to buffer from the first. This way I get to have fewer function pointers in my V table or in my unique pseudo function. The other approach would have involved having separate function pointers for destroying and moving. I'm going to, I see there is confusion. Any questions about this? Yes. There is no particular reason. Both are equally valid. In one case, you have a fewer function pointers, but you have this runtime bit of decision, do I need to move or not? In the other case, you have more function pointers, but fewer runtime decisions. Whichever constraint is more important to you, that's the one you pick. I don't believe either approach is universally better than the other. And this way, you get to have fewer slides. More questions? OK. So now, unique lifetime, instead of storing a void star, stores a buffer. And instead of storing a destroy impulse, it stores a destroy move impulse. Otherwise, it's pretty similar to before. By default, it's nothing, but otherwise, yes. Now, the move constructor. I'm going to use the destroy move function to first move whatever was in the other object to my buffer, then destroy it. Then I'll steal the other object's destroy move function pointer. Assignment is a little more complicated, but it's fundamentally the same thing. You just, you just have to pick the right sequence of calls to the destroy move. To first move the object to my buffer, then destroy the object in the original buffer, and you know, and also destroy any object containing this buffer if there was one. But the structure just calls destroy move with a null pointer. I don't need to move it anywhere, I'm just destroying it. Finally, the converting constructor that takes some t that I actually need to store, just constructs that t in the buffer and stores the appropriate function in destroy move. The vtable entries, they don't change really, only that instead of taking a void pointer, they take a buffer reference. Pseudo overload is exactly the same, it forwards all the same things, a unique pseudo function changes just a little bit. Now, instead of heap allocating the thing, I'll construct it in the buffer by forwarding the argument. And I'm using a separate tag dispatch here to just, whether you pass me a const L value reference or a mutable R value reference, I still end up storing the same object inside. The move constructor is slightly different. I can no longer use a copy swap idiom because that would be less efficient than the most efficient possible thing. But I still need to just steal the object in the other function to this function and also steal all of its function pointers. So, so far, we have a unique pseudo function that's move only and possibly trivially relocatable if that feature is available. It supports movable multiple overloads of a call operator with a correct type deduction. It can, construct, can be constructed from any invocable object. And if that object is simple and small enough, it will be stored in place, no heap allocations. And I can also efficiently convert from a big overload set to a smaller overload set. Before I show you the final code, I'd like to thank a whole bunch of people. I wouldn't be here today without them. And I'd like to thank all of you for spending your time to attend my talk. Thank you. And now I can show you the code and take final questions. Anyone? Yes. What about the uh, universal ending? So with an uh, ellipsis operator, we know. Um, I don't believe that would work. I hadn't thought of that. That's a good question. That'll keep me up until plane home. 
There you are. Looks like I'm done. Thank you all.